In three, two, one. Seven things you don't really need to know, but probably should. I'm Jamie East, and this, this is the Sunday Sun. In today's episode, we're taking you through our favourite science stories of the year. Buckle up as we revisit the billionaire space race, the Amazon rainforest that's now emitting carbon, and the reason why our brains see human faces in absolutely everything. But first, did you know it was this week in 1898 that Marie Curie discovered the chemical elements radium and polonium for which she won the Nobel Prize in physics in 1903? She was the first woman to win the prize and in 1911 became the first person to win it in two different scientific fields. I'm happy to say that not one, but that the first Two samples of another planet are prepped and stowed as the first official candidate samples to be returned to Earth by a future mission. Earlier this year, NASA's Mars rover Perseverance collected the first Martian rock samples from a Martian boulder dubbed Rochette. And as you can hear from Laurie Glaze, director of NASA's Planetary Science Division, it's a pretty big deal. You know, at NASA, we get to see a lot of things that rewrite the history books. And what occurred September 6th, at Jezero Crater is right up there with any of them. Perseverance was sent to Jezero Crater on Mars precisely because it looks to have had a habitable environment billions of years ago. And these rock samples seem to suggest that the scientists were right. An interesting thing about these rocks as well is that they show signs for sustained interaction with groundwater. Uh, if, if these rocks experience water for long periods of time, there may be habitable niches within these rocks that could have supported ancient microbial life. That's Jessica Samuels, the Perseverance Surface Mission Manager. As she and her fellow NASA colleagues explained in a media briefing, salt spotted within these rocks are suspected to have formed when groundwater flowered through the original minerals of the rocks or when liquid water evaporated. Just as salt minerals are known to preserve signs of ancient life on Earth, NASA hopes that these minerals have trapped tiny bubbles of ancient Martian water, which could serve as microscopic time capsules on the red planet. Now, as exciting as this prospect is, we might have to wait a little while before any of it's confirmed. The carefully selected samples of Martian rock and soil wouldn't be completely analysed immediately, as the equipment needed to do that's too complicated to send to Mars. Instead, the rover will hold on to the samples until they can be collected by another rover in about, oh, I don't know, 10 years' time. So even though it's a while before real analysis can take place, the NASA team's rightly over the moon with what they've achieved so far. I cannot overstate the significance of these rock samples that were collected by Perseverance. This is a truly historic achievement. You know, the very first rock cores collected on another terrestrial planet. It's amazing. So I developed a tick disorder during the pandemic and I thought that it was Lexapro that did me in because there's some research on that. But I just learned that the isolation of the pandemic has been causing a massive outbreak of Tourette symptoms in girls. If this pandemic ruins one more thing for me, <laughs> I'm gonna lose it. That's Alex Turnquist. As you can hear in her TikTok from March this year, seemingly out of nowhere, she developed a tick during the pandemic. It may sound odd, but she's not alone. Doctors who specialise in tick disorders have seen referrals balloon from 1-5% to of total cases pre-pandemic to 20-35% to of them now. This is something that Tamara Pringsheim, a neurologist at the University of Calgary, Canada, also observed. She runs the Tourette's Clinic in the Alberta Children's Hospital, and starting in autumn 2020, she began seeing an increase in young women who were developing the rapid and sudden onset of tick-like behaviours. Many of these young people had been been exposed to videos mainly on TikTok of other young people with tick-like behaviors. We saw many commonalities in the symptoms that these young people were having and the symptoms that were being demonstrated on social media. Whilst it's easy to point the finger at social media platforms, Tamara emphasizes that that's not the only factor at play here. You know, many people can watch the video and never develop ticks. I'd say that there are, there are individuals who have an, a pre-existing anxiety or mood disorder or who are psychologically distressed in whom seeing these videos can be very influential. 
So if it's not social media alone, what are the driving factors behind this rise of Tourette's-like ticks in young people? Researchers think the ticks could be the result of a perfect storm of reduced social interaction and increased social media use at a time of crucial development. I feel that if there wasn't a pandemic and there wasn't the pandemic-related restrictions, that perhaps uh, this would not have happened. Now, at this point, you'd be forgiven for making an association between the ticks we're discussing here and Tourette syndrome, the most widely known tick disorder. But that's not what we're seeing. Instead, Tamara calls these ticks functional neurological symptoms. Functional neurological symptoms are neurological symptoms that are not due to a demonstrated abnormality of the nervous system. As Tamara sees it, it's more of an issue with software rather than hardware. Functional neurological symptoms are nothing new, but... What's new is that until the past year, the presentation of functional neurological symptoms as ticks was very uncommon. It was much more common that we would see functional seizures or functional weakness. So that increase in ticks... Uh, we think is likely related to the increase in modelling. While Tourette's patients skew male, these referrals were nearly all girls and young women who tended to also have anxiety or a mood disorder. And they also suffered more extreme symptoms than Tourette's patients. I think it just really reinforces that um, people need each other. Uh, and that, you know, while 18 months may not feel like a long time, when you're middle-aged, it is an eternity to a young person. They're trying to protect others by not meeting, but it takes a large psychological toll. Still to come on the Sunday 7, Dolphin Loyalty and why you keep seeing faces in all sorts of places. When it comes to friendships and rivalries, male dolphins know who the good team players are. Research from the University of Bristol reveals that male dolphins form a social concept of team membership based on cooperative investment in the team. In the dolphin world, the ability to work as part of a team can earn you a pod full of pals. I am Dr Stephanie King and I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Bristol. Bottlenose dolphins form the most complex alliances outside humans. Alongside researchers and colleagues from home and abroad, Dr King led a recent study that aimed to discover how dolphins build alliances. To unravel the riddle, they used underwater speakers to play back dolphin signature whistles and then flew drones above the dolphin groups to record their behaviour. Our key findings were that males responded strongly to all of the allies that had consistently helped them out in the past, even if they weren't currently close friends. And on the other hand, they didn't respond strongly to males who hadn't consistently helped them out in the past, even if they were friends. Dolphins have memories to rival that of elephants, and they even hold grudges. Who knew? On the brighter side, they understand the concept of teamwork and they really value it. All these males have known each other since they were young calves, they have grown up together, they hang out together, so they're all friends. But what is really important to dolphins is which males are good team players and therefore part of their cooperative team. Unless you live under a rock, you've probably seen the Facebook post with the face of Kanye West in a pizza or the recent viral pic from New Haven that looked like the face of Neptune in a dramatic storm wave. Whether it's on tree trunks, in the clouds or even on a doorknob, humans are hardwired to see faces absolutely everywhere. The scientific term is face pareidolia, and until now, scientists haven't understood exactly what's going on in the brain when we do this. Now, though, neuroscientists at the University of Sydney have been busy figuring out what goes on up there when we see Jesus in a piece of toast. My name is David L.A. I'm a professor of psychology at the University of Sydney in Australia. Sometimes you see an object that happens to trigger a face response in the brain because it resembles the classic face configuration. You have apparently two eyes over a nose and a mouth. And we know that that's enough to trigger the brain to respond very vigorously as if it's a face. The same face processing regions in the brain respond to these so-called face pareidolia images as response to real faces. So we wanted to know, does the brain not just recognise that this might be a face, but go on to extract the emotional content from it. So, how do you figure this out? 
These faces are often strikingly expressive, so we had a series of faces presented to, to observers who simply sat in front of the computer screen and rated how happy or angry the face looked on a continuum. And it's well known with real faces that when you see a happy face, the next face looks even happier. Or if you see an angry face, the next one looks angrier. So we wanted to know if that carryover effect would occur with these pareidolia faces. And it does. And in fact, the pareidolia face previous can still prime up a real face on the current trial. So it's as if the brain responds to faces and pareidolia images and extracts their expression in exactly the same way and makes no distinction. How very strange, but is there a benefit to this human quirk? We're the most sophisticated social species and it's vitally important that we very quickly uh, and without a fail detect faces. What we use is this face template of two eyes over a nose and a mouth. It's very quick and efficient to apply by the brain, takes no cognitive effort and it rarely misses a face. On the other hand, you get the occasional false positive when an object that resembles a face triggers a face response in your brain. If you think about what this means, well, we can be thankful for one thing. We wouldn't have emojis if we didn't have the ability to extract emotion from things that appear to be faces. Still to come on the Sunday 7, how to reverse greying hair and bad news for the Amazon rainforest. Right after this. You're listening to the Sunday 7. Follow us for your weekday news espresso or even try our island edition. It's in all the usual places. The Amazon rainforest. It's long been known as the lungs of the earth for its ability to produce oxygen and suck in carbon. But new research from the National Institute for Space Research in Brazil has confirmed that the Amazon rainforest is in deep trouble. It's now emitting more carbon dioxide than it's able to absorb. The giant forest had previously been a carbon sink, absorbing the emissions driving the climate crisis, but is now causing its acceleration. This is devastating news for both the environment and Luciana Garci, the researcher who led the investigation. The emissions from deforestation and the biomass burning are three times higher than the uptake that forests are doing. Amazon is not just a amount of carbon fixed in trees, you know, and that can make a nice service to us, compensate part of our carbon emissions. It is also a very complex system in a very delicate equilibrium. When we deforested and the deforestation is more concentrated in some areas, we are promoting a climate change, especially during dry season. Luciana, this must have been a real surprise. How did it make you feel when you found out? Ah, depressed. The press said we have these results since 2016 and uh, was a big responsibility to say this for the world. We are making Amazon accelerate the climate change. It, it, it's much worse than we think. We need to start to sink in nature like a domino. We need to stop think that the nature is simple and we can control. The best is we reduce the impact we do and try to fix part of the damage we've done in, in nature. That is a lot. OK, help me out here. From a political point of view, whose responsibility is it to sort this mess out? I, I think the biggest problem is when the, the political body, you know, from one nation, don't list the signs, don't... don't have a, a nice decision based in, in the acknowledgement we develop about how the climate is changing. What are your hopes for the future of the Amazon rainforest? It's a nightmare what's happening today. You know, it's, it's really difficult to, for Brazilian scientists today, you know, to, to see what's happening in society. I hope we construct a better future for us. So, while space travel still seems like a far-off dream for most of us, Richard Branson has had his eyes on the prize since at least the late 80s. 
Back in 1988, he was a guest on the BBC show Going Live and responding to queries from viewers at home when he got this question. Um, have you ever thought about going to, into space, Richard? <laughs> Um, I'd love to go into space, as I think pretty well everybody watching this show would um, love to go to space. Um, I mean, the, when you see those magnificent pictures of um, in space and the incredible views, um, I think there could, be, there could be nothing nicer. So if you're building a spacecraft, I'd love to come with you on it. That call led him to register the name Virgin Galactic the very next day. And now, on Sunday the 11th of July 2021, Richard Branson is set to make that dream a reality. And it's taken us a long time and it's taken us 17 years of hard work, you know, from when we really started uh, with a vengeance to get this done. We've had highs, we've had lows, but um, yeah, finally we're, we're there. And he's already thinking about what he's going to do differently next time. Speaking in an Instagram Live, Richard explains what he'll want to change when Virgin Galactic is open for customers. I, I want a slightly more comfortable seat rest for future customers. Um, the water flask, it's, the top is apt to pop and therefore you've got water all over <laughs> the cabin. So I, I want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, if you're floating around, orientated when you're floating around, you know what your colour is, so you can go back to your seat. Oh, I'm dyslexic, uh, and just in case of something ever went wrong, I want the parachute straps to be different in colour uh, oh. to the, the seatbelt straps. Um, anyway, so it, well, one advantage of sending up a dyslexic kid who, um, into space is that, you know, I can, I can spot all these little details, and, and in any company, it's sorting out the details that makes for perfection and makes it really a pleasure for customers to experience your company. Now something that's close to my heart. No matter how many boxes of Swarshkoff or Just For Men you buy, greying is an inevitable part of getting older. Or is it? According to a new study, there might be other factors at play, and perhaps you've noticed. Take Tony Blair or Barack Obama. If you compare images from their first days in office to their last, it appears that their demanding and high-stress jobs have taken a toll on their once dark and luscious locks. Now, this might seem obvious, but researchers from Columbia University are the first to offer quantitative evidence linking psychological stress to greying hair in people. And their study has produced some surprising results. What we found was that hair graying in humans is reversible and that the reversibility of hair graying is associated with stress or the removal of psychological stress. And what this shows is that the human aging process, which we tend to think of as a very linear and predetermined process, is actually flexible. This is Dr. Martin Picard, the study's senior author. What we found in our study is that there are some individuals who have experienced stress and during stressful periods have some hairs that actually turned from dark to white. And then when the stress goes away, the white hair can revert back to its dark state. I'm no spring chicken and I've certainly got my fair share of grey hair. If I stress less, does that mean my youthful plumage returns? Well, that's a good question. I don't think it's that simple. Uh, and stressing less, you know, is easier said than done. You know, there are certainly things we can do to uh, reduce our stress levels, uh, like, you know, choosing to hang out with uh, people we feel good uh, with, uh, deciding to engage in activities that make us feel inspired. Uh, moving, doing physical activity, not eating too much. These are things that we know can positively influence our biology and can positively influence the aging process. So doctor, will you be adding an extra holiday to your beauty regime? <laughs> I think one conclusion from this is that uh, possibly taking time off or at least finding ways to feel better is very likely to have an impact on our biology. This has been the Sunday 7. Wherever you're listening, do us a favour and hit the follow button. We'll be back tomorrow at 7am with the regular Smart 7. Have a great rest of your weekend. Written, produced and published by Daft Doris.